So uh, why you might consider listening to us. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my partner, uh, Dr. Sean Devine. Uh, first off, he's been a, a great partner for me to have. Uh, I've been in practice for about 10 years, and uh, when you first come out and practice, you have a lot of questions. It's nice to have a mentor, and Dr. Devine has really done that for me. Uh, he's fellowship trained in sports medicine. We have uh, essentially the same training, but he's got just that much more experience, which has been great for me. Uh, we're able to sort of talk about cases back and forth in the office and uh, really value his opinion. Um, so so that's, that's why I really value him as a partner, and I think uh, I value him as a, a presenter tonight because he brings all that experience, uh, especially with working with Cal Poly, Cuesta, uh, AG High School, and, and also uh, his experience in fellowship working with uh, the elite of the elite athletes. And I'd like to just say a little thank you to Dignity Health for sponsoring this. It's very kind of them. Um, and I would like to kind of re return the kind uh, comments about Otto. Otto's a, he and I are in some ways mirror image practitioners. It's a pleasure to have him. Um, in terms of passing around compliments, um, when my son was hurt, I talked to Otto. And we talk about every single, uh, of many of our complicated cases, so it's really a wonderful team. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, you know, training, um, our training entails fellowship and specialty certification. And nobody knows what that means, but it, it sort of means that we kind of went the extra step, competed for and got accepted in one of a few kind of nationally recognized specialty centers for shoulder and knee training. Completed that, took the certification process testing, and we're certified. Our hope in going through all that is that we can bring the highest level of technical expertise here locally so you don't feel like you need to go somewhere else to get that. Um, and that may be applying to your shoulder decisions because some people are intimidated about the idea of having a shoulder problem. Um, what do we hope to accomplish tonight? Uh, there's a couple things we'd like to do to start off is, is to talk a little bit about the anatomy and also to introduce you to some of the terminology that you may hear in, in one of our offices or in the presentation tonight and then talk about some of the most common uh, shoulder problems that we see in the office. We obviously won't be able to talk about all of them but there's sort of the top five that we'll hit tonight and then if there's questions afterwards uh, specific about maybe one of your own shoulders we're happy to entertain those questions at the end. In terms of uh, our practices, if you look at most of the patients that are coming in, they're going to fit in these diagnostic categories. What we'll do is we'll sort of start with the most common, the rotator cuff issues, impingement issues, and then work through the others sequentially. I don't know if we'll get through everything, but if we don't, again, we can certainly answer your specific questions later. So. Uh, We'll start at the beginning. Uh, I have a little bit of an animation that I'll, I'll use to highlight some of the pertinent anatomy, the bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Uh, it goes a little quick, so I'll probably pause it here a little bit. Uh, this is just showing the remarkable range of motion that we have at our shoulder. And because it is a what, what's called a constrained joint, meaning the bones don't hold or restrict the anatomy, it's the muscles, soft tissues, and ligaments that do that. That allows us to have that huge range of motion. Because of that, all those structures are potentially uh, uh, susceptible to injury. Now, like we talked about, the, the bones of the shoulder, we have this long bone here called the humerus, the scapula, and the end of the scapula is called the glenoid, and that is the ball and socket. The clavicle, obviously we know where that is. Uh, and that articulates uh, with the acromion. That's a, that's a word that you're going to hear tonight is the acromion. That's just a specialized area of the scapula right above the shoulder, and that's oftentimes where the rotator cuff gets pinched. The glenohumeral joint, again, I talked about is the ball and socket joint. That's what we usually talk about as the shoulder joint. There's a couple other joints that are less important, the one at the uh, uh, end of the clavicle and the sternum. And then very important is the scapulothoracic joint where your shoulder uh, uh, articulates on the rib cage. And that's important because you get about a third of your range of motion from this pseudo joint. 
So even people that have a shoulder fusion can have a little bit of motion. Moving on here. So we see that the ball and socket joint, one of the terms that we'll talk about is arthritis. The uh, arthritis is a description of loss of this articular cartilage. That cartilage is specialized tissue that allows joints to move smoothly uh, together. And in the shoulder joint, there's about an eighth of an inch of cartilage there. In a bigger joint like the knee, you have probably about a quarter inch. And when that wears down, that's what we call arthritis. We look at the shoulder joint again, there's all these ligaments around. Uh, these are things that are injured when someone dislocates their shoulder joint. We're not going to talk about that specifically tonight. The ligaments at the end of the clavicle can be injured. That's what people will have a, uh, a shoulder separation. Again, we can talk about that at the end if you like. One of the things I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about is, again, this surface is called the glenoid. That's the socket of the ball and socket joint. And around that socket is a specialized tissue called the labrum. That's made of cartilage too, so it gets a little confusing because there's cartilage on the end of the bone here, but then there's a, a uh, specialized tissue called the labrum that's made of cartilage as well. That can be injured uh, in a traumatic uh, dislocation of the shoulder. It also can wear down uh, during the course of just living. And sometimes people have an MRI that says, oh, there is a labral tear, uh, and that's sort of a normal part of aging. So we don't worry about that so much when we get up into the 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. At the top part of this labrum is where a structure called the biceps tendon attaches. That's another potential area of uh, injury. You'll see that here in a minute. They'll put the humeral head back on and you can get some orientation there. The uh, biceps tendon sometimes is injured along with a rotator cuff, so I want you to sort of know where that is. The biceps refers to this muscle down here, and bi meaning two. There's two attachments, the long head here and the short head here. This one's never a problem. This is sometimes a cause of uh, pain, and something you may hear about, oh, you have a rotator cuff tear and also a biceps tendon tear. So that runs up through the shoulder. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit further in the talk. Um, but sort of these are the basic sort of structures we want you to have a, a, a working knowledge of. The most important thing that we're going to talk about, and that comes up next, is the rotator cuff which is a group of muscles that surround this shoulder joint. Now it's a, a cuff of tissue, not a cup, a cuff, and it's a confluence of four muscles. I'm not gonna bore you with the names of the muscles, but essentially those muscles help to hold this ball and socket joint together while the larger muscle, called the deltoid, moves the shoulder around. The reason that it's important is if this shoulder joint is not held tightly together, mm -hmm. your shoulder just sort of shifts up and you lose range of motion. So it's very, very important that we have a good functioning rotator cuff. So uh, to discuss this, I'm gonna present a case to Dr. Devine of a 62-year-old ten tennis player that comes to the office complaining of shoulder pain. So first question, what are you gonna do first? Well. <laughs> Well, uh, probably the first thing I want to know is where's the pain? Yeah. So that's a very common question. Sometimes people come and say, I have terrible shoulder pain. Yeah. What if the patient tells you that? Whenever the patient's pointing more up at the base of the neck, we're thinking neck. The same thing I had a patient today that was describing, I have this terrible burning pain in the back of my shoulder and down to my hand. So when we hear those things, we're thinking neck. That isn't shoulder pain. That's neck, etiology, nerve pain. So that's important. Shoulder pain tends to be here. This is your shoulder, and the pain tends to be, it can radiate up or down, but it tends to localize here. The greatest majority of patients with shoulder pain will say, yeah, doc, it's, it's here. Okay. So Sometimes we'll, down the deltoid, but you grab this, not here, not down the back. So this, this is a shoulder pain person. They say it hurts here. What's the next question? Well, now I want to know what happened. You know, why are you here? What, what changed? What's different? 
So let's say the patient comes in and says, well, I was building a barbecue pit and lifting bricks and cinder blocks and now my shoulder hurts and when I try to play tennis, I have a hard time with my overhead shots and my shoulders sore for the next three days afterwards. Okay. That, that's kind of the classic presentation that we'll see in our typical 40, 50 year old weekend warrior. Okay. It's what we call impingement and we'll talk about that in, in just a minute more, that's the irritation of the rotator cuff uh, in the shoulder uh, where it's getting pinched between the bones. So this is the impingement syndrome and although it can be an acute process where somebody really goes out and overdoes it, puts in fence poles, does some work, it usually isn't an acute injury. It's usually a, a degenerative process that's starting, the cuff is getting thicker, and then there's an identified overuse where you go out and do too much, the bursa swells, the cuff swells, now you're pinching, now you're very painful. Um, with time, the rotator cuff, as we age, it does thicken. So we literally see the space available for the cuff get more narrow effectively with time. As I've gotten fatter, I've bought bigger pants, but we don't have that option in the shoulder. As our cuff starts to wear and thicken and delaminate, we don't get more space. We, in fact, get less space, and that's why impingement syndrome is almost, almost taken for granted. Most of us in the audience are going to get an element of it. Okay. Here's your video. This is an uh, animation, and what it's showing is this swelling right here, this is that bursa tissue that's swelling with irritation. And that's the tissue right immediately above the rotator cuff. And as you raise the arm up, you're getting pinching. You're getting that bursa tissue pinching up the, uh, against that bone. Otto showed you earlier the acromion. And that's going to cause the typical pain with overhead activities, reaching to get the seat belt, reaching into the back seat to get the purse, tennis, golf, those overhead activities. That's what we're talking about with impingement syndrome. Well, how do we treat it? I always start with a uh, home program. I mean, most of my patients are going to come and I'm going to say, you know, you want to start this simple? And most people say, yeah, let's, let's, let's see if I can work this out. Um, I really try to simplify the treatment. So for my patients, I've, I've broken it down, the rehab, the home program into what are the four things that make it pinch and what are the four things you can do to try and lessen or eliminate those causes, okay? Um, this is sort of a take-home slide for you. Uh, it sort of works with so many of our shoulder problems. The first problem we just saw with the video is swelling. That bursa is swollen, the cuff is swollen. We have to address that. The easiest way to address it is with icing. My college athletes, they ice. They're in the training room, they're in ice baths. I mean, they're on it. We as adults, we hardly ever ice. We're really lazy and yet we're the ones that really ought to be icing. Um, the other thing is to consider your anti-inflammatory medicines. I like small. My daughter actually got this for us and, and I've sort of run with it because I think it's terrific. This is a small little jello pack. Um, I want to make icing convenient. If it's fussy, I won't do it, you won't do it. So the big leaky bag of ice, forget it. It's going to leak and you'll never do it again. The half defrosted peas and corn, it's never half defrosted, okay? So get, get one of these, get small so it doesn't freeze you down, then you won't mind putting it on at night when you're trying to relax before going to bed. Um, by making it simple and easy, you'll actually consider doing it. The next thing we talk about is arm position. And my rule, my shoulder 11th commandment is keep your elbow below your heart. Um, we sort of saw the, the video demonstration of the shoulder um, with the arm down at your side. Down, we've got a nice space between the bones. The bursa and the rotator cuff, they've got a living space. They're not crowded. But when you're up in that reaching position, when that elbow is up, that space becomes very small. 
and that's the impingement syndrome. So we want to limit that ongoing irritation. You can't throw gasoline on a burning fire and think it's going out. So I always tell people, you got to get that elbow down for your activities, reaching, carrying, lifting, pulling. Um, even the athletes that work out, you can do almost all of your regular workout with just some simple modifications. Where's my elbow? Where's my heart? Keep it low. I can do 90% of my workout and not beat up my cuff. The third issue is flexibility. I'm going to show you kind of a messy slide here. This is sort of a physics slide, and it's just a prompt for me to talk about when your shoulder gets inflamed, the back of the shoulder tightens up. When the back of the shoulder tightens up, it forces the ball up when you raise the arm up. And so you'll get obligate pinching. It's going to pinch if you're tight in the back. And so that's the first thing I'll look at with my baseball pitchers. Are they tight in the back? It's the first thing I'm going to look at you when you come in, in the office is, are you tight back there? Do we really need to work to get that flexibility back? Because you're pinching every time you do have to lift. Concentrate on that tight posterior capsule, and we need to stretch. Now, I don't like to stretch. I really don't like to stretch. <laughs> My wife's a good stretcher. She'll vouch for this. And, and I'm not going to be a hypocrite and give you a program that I won't do. So I've tried to get you to stretch the way I might consider it. And, and that is to make it really easy, really quick, and not hurt. So instead of it being a bad experience, I just want you to do a light, quick, 10-second stretch, but I want it 10 times a day, or six times a day. This is Deanna, one of our office. Uh, X-ray text showing you just finger ladders up, stretch it up. And this is the stretch behind the back. She's using her good arm to kind of drive that stiff arm up. You know, these two maneuvers take her 10 seconds. And my hope is you'll do that six to 10 times a day. Now, if I ask you to do that every hour, will you do it? You'll do it twice. That's it. And then you'll be doing something and it won't work out. So I needed some way, some prompt for my patients to remember to stretch. And I thought, what do you do six times a day? Well, you pee. <laughs> you go to the bathroom. And as we get older, it might even be more. <laughs> and so that's going to be our couple. When you go to the bathroom, you do a quick 10-second stretch. And at the end of the day, wow, I stretched six, seven, maybe 10 times. That was a great day and it was no extra hassle. Oops, the final thing is strengthening, okay? As Otto showed you before in, in our animation, the deltoid and the cuff work together to raise your arm up. The deltoid without a good cuff is hurting you because it's actually gonna pull that ball up into the acromion causing impingement. You've gotta have the balancing force of the cuff to hold it down. And, and it never made sense to me early in my training, my cuffs hurt, why do you want me to strengthen my cuff? That hurts. Well, it's because you will need to lift. You need to maintain that balance. So again, the principle is keep it simple. Make it simple, make it easy, make it quick, and make it not hurt, and you have a small chance that people might actually do it. I like the surgical tubing. It's available at supply stores, sports stores, everywhere. Um, and I, I said, okay, I want one minute twice a day. I want two simple exercises, 30 seconds each, twice a day. This is the simple elastic tubing. Deanna's going to show you the first exercise, the simple row. As Otto said, the scapula is critical, and so with the row, we're really working on the scapular muscles to keep the scapula well positioned. And the second one is the standard baseball uh, Job exercise, the external rotation, where you start in this position and then you rotate the arm out away from your tummy. That works the rotator cuff very specifically. And the idea here is, what do you do twice a day, every day, that I can couple this to, that I might get a chance you do it? I came up with dental hygiene. Most of us brush our teeth morning and evening, so that's gonna be our strengthening couple. When you finish brushing your teeth, turn to the door, grab the tubing, do just a quick minute of your two simple exercises, and you've kind of got the program. You're addressing the swelling, you're sensitive about arm position, you're doing the stretching, you're doing the strengthening. It's a really good start to making your shoulder feel better. Okay, so 
So Sean just explained all the home exercises and uh, a little personal uh, experience here is I hurt my shoulder sort of bad when I was in fellowship learning about shoulder surgery. And I knew all these exercises do. I had access to the surgical tubing and you know how many times I did it? Twice. <laughs> so, so I sort of figured I knew what to do and I didn't do it. So how can I expect my patients to do it? So I offer everybody formal physical therapy so they have an appointment that they need to keep and, and it's just a difference in style. Um, if the home exercise program doesn't work, I think the formal physical therapy is a very good next step. And it doesn't have to be one or the other, it can be both concurrently. But a mistake patients make going to therapy is they go to what I call in the box therapy, three to six weeks, they're really good about their exercises, they make some initial progress and then guess what happens? Therapy's over and the program dies, okay? And that is the bane of a lot of our programs. You have to make sure you've got a carryover program you're gonna to continue to do on your own if you wanna maintain the benefit. Because, you know, I, I see a lot of people that have a touch of gray like me. We don't get better in four to six weeks. We don't do anything in four to six weeks except get worse. You need to keep it going. Okay. okay. What, what? So let's say, Dr. Devine, the patient has done their home exercise program every time they go pee and they do their strengthening every time they brush their teeth and they come back and they say, it still hurts, now what? Okay. There may be a role for a cortisone shot. Cortisone is a strong anti-inflammatory. It shrinks swelling, okay? The downside of cortisone is it has a slight weakening effect on pretty much all human tissue. And if you Google cortisone, you'll see about 30 complications that it can cause if you take high doses regularly. We don't know, we truly don't know what a safe amount of cortisone is, but we know a shot or two is very safe. So it can be considered in the setting of somebody who really has impingement, but we don't think they've actually shredded their cuff. We, we think they have the opportunity to get better. We just need to sort of block that cycle. Some people will be swollen because they're swollen, they pinch. Because they pinch, they stay swollen, and they can't break out of the cycle. And sometimes cortisone can break that cycle. That's really the only way it's gonna create permanent improvement, because the medicine's gone in a few weeks. Okay. This, this is a uh, MRI picture, and I, I think people can figure it out. This is the socket, this is the humerus, the ball. This is that acromion we were talking about. This is the collarbone. This is the rotator cuff coming through here. And this acromion sticks down. It's angled down a little more than normal and the space available for the cuff is really tight. Unfortunately, some of us are gonna have this anatomy and it predisposes us to pinching. And you have to be perfect. And anything short of perfect, you're gonna get more wear, you're gonna end up with more problems and tearing. So this is a situation that may force our hand to go to the next step. Well, that was... Now, Dr. Devine, can you show us on that MRI where you would give the cortisone shot? I, I, I sort of jumped in without talking about, you know, is there a role for MRI? And, and this can be one of the roles to look at the the actual anatomy in a three-dimensional capacity. And you can actually look at the rotator cuff and see if it's okay or see if it's torn. In the situation where we may consider cortisone, the cuff is intact, but they've got that at-risk anatomy. They've got kind of the deck stacked against them, but they might be able to get better without surgery. Um, we're trying to get that right in here. That bursa area can be pretty small. We're trying to get it in this area. This little white area here is probably our our best target area to get that shot into. And how, how painful is that shot? <laughs> um, yeah, let's get some input from the audience. We've got a lot of patients here who had it. All right, let's do that as a show of hands. How many have had a cortisone shot? Wow. And how many would say it was pretty painful? And how many would say it was less painful than they anticipated? Okay, about almost an even split. Um, and that's kind of our experience. I think that many of my patients will say, 
wow, that wasn't as bad as I was prepared for. And I say, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. But it, it can be a little sore, but I think in the big picture, it's probably worth it because it's always safer and it's always less painful than surgery. And there's, there's, two, there's two reasons that we give those shots. The first Dr. Devine already mentioned, which is if we can uh, affect the swelling in the rotator cuff, that's great for you. But the other thing that's really good about that is in that injection, we give some local anesthetic that should numb up everything that it touches. So if we give that injection into this subacromial space here and you get transiently better, we know your problem is here. If you don't get better with that shot, your problem may be in the actual joint. With an intact rotator cuff tendon, there should be no communication with that stuff we inject here into the joint. So I find that injection to be a very powerful uh, diagnostic tool that's in my hands seems to be almost as good as the MRI for figuring out where the particular problem is. This next slide is actually an uh, arthroscopic picture during surgery. The last si slide showed how that acromion sort of stuck down. This is a surgical slide, and this is what the tissue on the end of the acromion looks like. It's supposed to be smooth. It's supposed to look like this. Um, but in this situation, this is a classic impingement situation. That patient's been grinding away, and now it's really rough, and it's actually starting to get a kissing lesion down here where the rotator cuff is starting to tear. So let's say that uh, you've had the anti-inflammatories, which usually we recommend taking the lowest dose the least frequent amount of times as possible. You've had the home physical therapy, you've had the formal physical therapy, you've had a cortisone injection that helped you for 30 or 60 minutes, and now your shoulder really, really hurts. What do we do now? Well, now it's time to at least consider arthroscopy. Now it's time to consider a clean out where we can go in and we can basically give you a bigger pair of pants, okay? <laughs> That's what we're talking about. We're talking about giving the cuff more space. And so with the telescope, we can go in and we can take out some thickened scar tissue. We can take out some bone spurs. We can basically do a, a shoulder tune-up with a couple of little nicks and a 45-minute surgery, which you know, turn over to Otto at this point. Sure. So the, the procedure is called arthroscopy, arthro referring to the joint and scope referring to the, the uh, 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 tool that we use to look inside. We can see this all on a video screen so we don't have to make big incisions. The incisions are probably about the diameter of your pinky and you usually get about three of those for that procedure. And the, what we see inside looks something like this. So we have a, let's see here. We have a bone spur that's formed right up in here, and it doesn't look like much, but once we're done, we want to get this whole thing flat. And we'll just let that play there. We use this little tool. It's like a small Dremel that has a suction attached to it, so we're able to suck out all those little pieces of bone. And this is sped up a couple of times, so we're not you know, yeah. doing it this <laughs> fast. No, auto really is this fast. Jackrabbit. Yeah. Right. I blink and I miss the whole surgery. Right. So what we're trying to do is create a flat undersurface of the bone called the acromion, and that sits right over the rotator cuff. And, the, and that's, that's what we've done there. You see a little bit of bleeding. This is magnified probably, oh, five to eight times. So get a little bleeding like that, not a big problem. Um, and the surgery takes probably about 45 minutes. You go home the same day. If in, done in the right circumstances, it's very successful. Okay. So let's continue with our 62-year-old tennis player with shoulder pain. But this patient presents a bit differently. Now the patient comes in and says, my shoulder hurts, but it also feels weak. What is that telling you? Weakness. You can have secondary weakness, reactive weakness, just from pain, okay? So in the setting of an acute injury where you're really painful, you can be weak. We're not talking about that. We're talking about sustained weakness. 
where the patient isn't in exqui exquisite pain now, but he says, you know, doc, my shoulder's weak. I'm really, I can't lift it. Okay, that's a hallmark of a tear. That's what we're really looking for in terms of a tear. That tells me, boy, I gotta be thinking rotator cuff tear. Right. Okay. And so the presentation of that that we'll see is, sometimes people will come and say, well, I was walking along and I fell, and now I can't lift my shoulder, it feels weak. So that's an, an acute presentation of a rotator cuff tear. Sometimes those can be fractured, but for what we're talking about tonight, an acute rotator cuff tear that pulls right off the bone. Probably more often we'll see in the office that someone will have progressive pain and loss of motion, and they may not detect that weakness until we examine the shoulder. That in my practice is a much more common situation. Me too, me too. Yeah, it's the active middle-aged patient that's active and is just having to slow down and start giving away their activities. It's chronic and they come in, God, it's just, they're the male pattern denial that really doesn't want to see the doctor, that just wants to keep adapting and adapting. And finally the wife says, you're going to the doctor. You know, you're taking that trash out. <laughs> Most of these tears start in that delamination process we talked about. They probably start internally, and then with time they'll break through. And when you get the breakthrough, that's when the pain really gets increased, and they, they can start to have the weakness when it completely detaches. Can you hold up there? Can you tell us why the rotator cuff tear is there? Well, we, we kind of talked about the mechanical causes. That's an area where you can actually get mechanical wear. Um, there's also some biologic causes. It, it, it's actually a tissue of very poor blood supply. And, and that's our bane as surgeons because we're able to sew it back together, but that doesn't mean it's gonna heal. We've gotta wait for it to heal. We've gotta let the blood supply reestablish the healing response. So, what you do need to know is that that is a kind of a special tissue that's a little biologically challenged and it, it does have a big effect on our rehab protocols. Um, I don't know if that was... Right. I, I, the point I wanted to make is that the blood supply in that area of the rotator cuff is not great. The, the blood supply here is fantastic because that's all muscle. The blood supply here in the bone is fantastic, but in here we call this our watershed area. And again, I think the point there is that the blood supply isn't perfect, so when we're doing our post-operative rehab, we have to keep that in mind. And, and I think if you use the analogy of planting a tree, you have to wait until that tree grows roots to really get the stability. And that's what we do is we plant the tree and we're waiting for those roots to grow. Okay. What are the things you look for to make the diagnosis? So first off, the, the patient's history, what the patient tells us is, is critical. Second, and probably, uh, well, probably second important, is the physical exam. And what we're looking for specifically is weakness with the arm away from the body, and then weakness with the arm coming out. Some, sometimes patients will have a very good deltoid muscle where they've been compensating for a torn rotator cuff for a long time. And, and they can sort of fool us. And then the MRI is critical in determining whether it's actually a rotator cuff tear or not. This here is an MRI. And an MRI is a study that we get. There's no radiation involved. It's, it uses a very strong magnet. And it will show not only the bones, but the soft tissue. This is our ball of our ball and socket joint. Here's our socket. And this is the rotator cuff tendon, the rotator cuff muscles here. This part should go all the way over here. You can see a little piece of that still there. And this is our rotator cuff tear. So again, the rotator cuff is a tendon. It should be attached here. And you see all this white stuff is fluid. So there's, there's no attachment of this to there. So that's a very typical uh, look of a rotator cuff tear. Your doctor tells you you have a rotator cuff tear, now what? We're obviously gonna look at the patient. We're gonna say, you know, is this a, a young, high demand patient? That patient's gonna absolutely require a repair. Is it a very old, low activity senior? 
that may not need that rotator cuff repaired. So that's probably my number one criteria is what are your goals, what are your expectations in terms of shoulder function? Okay. Number two, what's the size of the tear? Okay. We are just terrific now with small, medium, and medium-large tears. When they get massive, that kind of rewrites the rules. So we have to be a little careful when we start getting into those really large tears because then it's different and we have to be careful with our patient selection and expectations. Um, what are the treatment options? Well, there's obviously if it's a very small tear in a older patient, low demand, we may just observe it. We may just do rehab. As I said, if it's a tear in a, a, a higher demand, middle-aged, 50, 60-year-old, we're really going to recommend to get on that because the situation is not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. So, uh, Dr. Devine, can you share with us um, what the expected function is for someone that has a large tear? What are we talking about in terms so of... So range of motion, uh, is it possible that someone can raise their arm if they do have a rotator cuff tear? Yeah, we will see, as we talked about at the beginning, the rotator cuff is four muscles that form a cuff of tendon. And it's almost spectacular the difference you'll see in some patients. You'll get some patients that have a rotator cuff tear and they can't do a thing. They're almost paralyzed by it. And that can occur for a number of reasons. The size, the retraction, the strength of the surrounding muscles have a big part of that. Some people are very good at retraining the intact cuff in the front and the back, and they can literally amaze you at how well they can do with a large tear. And so again, when we're dealing with a lower demand, more senior patient with a large cuff tear that may be very difficult to tear, Rehab may be a very good option that for that patient, given their goals, okay? Given their goals. Um, my goal with most of my seniors is I really want my patients to be able to get their hand to the top of their head. If you can do your hair, ladies, you're happy. And if you can't, you ain't happy. Um, so it may be goals as modest as that. Our next slide, you may have to help me. This is an animation of one of our rotator cuff repairs. These are the little nicks. This is the telescope looking in. These are the cannulas, and we have little shavers that we can trim the edge of the cuff to get back to healthy tissue. We can make little drill holes and put, tap the holes, just like if you went to miners. And now we're gonna drop in our new anchors, and those will just screw right into the bone. We have special titanium and plastics. We have attached ultra braid sutures that's super strong, and we can sew that rotator cuff, tightening the knots, pulling it right back to the bone, and then get out. And, and so, so through those quick little nicks, we can secure a rotator cuff repair. All right, so uh, let's see. The next slide is going to be a uh, arthroscopic uh, picture. This is a rotator cuff repair that I did oh, a couple months ago. <coughs> And this is just the uh, examination of the shoulder joint, so the arthroscopy, looking into the shoulder joint. We look for other associated problems, see if there's any problems with the uh, uh, cartilage on the end of the bone. We look at the labrum, we look at the biceps tendon. Uh, this is just a little metal probe that we're looking around. Right here is the biceps tendon. Oftentimes there'll be tears or that will subluxate. We always look at those structures to make sure we're not just focusing on the rotator cuff. It's difficult to get a perspective, but up in here, this is where the tear of the rotator cuff is. And we'll show that a little bit better in a second. We look at the tendons in the front, the subscapularis is another one of those tendons that we look at, that one is fine. And then we do our smoothing, oops. So, so here is the stitches that we're putting in there. Uh, we can do stitches from rotator cuff to rotator cuff. And then here's the actual tear. And we'll see that we're going to put some stitches in here to draw that together. Uh, just like that. This is all bone down here. There's the cartilage. And we need to put some anchors in there. We dra drop a little pilot hole in there. We're just overpaid carpenters. That's all we are. So this, this anchor is made of titanium. It has uh, three sutures loaded down the center of that. 
And arthroscopically through those three small poke holes, we're able to pass those stitches through this rotator cuff tissue, bring it down to this bone here that's been uh, prepared. And then uh, I'll just show you a couple of these knots being tied. Um, this is one of the things that, that Sean and I like to do is sort of uh, you know, tie these knots down, secure this. Instead of having to open up the whole shoulder, um, back when I was in my residency, we'd do the whole arthroscopic procedure, but then we'd make an incision on the side of the shoulder, look right in there and stare right at it and tie it uh, normal. Uh, this we can all do through those uh, little cannulas. They're about uh, seven millimeters or so. We cut those knots, uh, we'll tie the rest of these. Um, and uh, we use sliding knots and half hitches, and it's a very secure uh, way to fixate this. This is all about the same. I don't know if I want to bore you with the rest of that, so we'll probably just advance here. Okay, so what are the advances in rotator cuff repair you've seen over the course of your career? Well, Otto just sort of alluded to it. When I was in training, we would poke the scope in, we would look and go up, oh, yep, it's a tear. And then we'd put the scope away, make the cut, pull the muscle open, try to see in there, grab the cuff, you know, do the holes, close it up. The patient would be miserable, half the time spend the night, go home the next day. And that was kind of rotator cuff and that generated some well-deserved horror stories from patients about, oh my God, it was rough. Um, that changed. In, in the course of my training, it was changing, and by the time Otto was doing his fellowship, we wouldn't consider opening up a shoulder, you know? You do the scope, then you go right to the rotator cuff, and it, it's been driven by a lot of things. Better cameras, better sutures, better anchors, um, better techniques for sewing and tying knots, but the fact is now, this has become a, an outpatient surgery, a couple of hours. Um, literally, you know, three, four, sometimes five little nicks. And uh, I hope you're starting to get a flavor for how well we can see in there. I mean, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. In some ways, it's easier to see the big tears with the scope than it ever was when we were trying to peek in through the muscle, especially some of my bigger athletes. They might have four inches of deltoid that I'm trying to peek through. It, you know, it's hard. Um, what about anesthesia? You alluded to that earlier. So one of the, Sean mentioned that earlier is that uh, pain control is a, a big issue after shoulder surgery in the past. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we started doing more arthroscopic procedures is patients were able to tolerate the procedure better and were able to go home. Early on, we'd start using uh, pain pumps that would drip in local anesthetic around the shoulder, and those even worked better you know, with the pain control than the initial, but now we have something even better, which uh, in my opinion uh, is the uh, regional anesthesia. Uh, for about the last year or so on every shoulder case I do, I have the anesthesiologist, before I even start the procedure, numb up the nerves that supply pain or uh, uh, bring feedback from the shoulder about pain, so the patient never experiences the pain. So there's, there's a lot of positive things that happen. The, the, the body doesn't get revved up by having a lot of pain, and then you're sort of playing catch up. So that works very, very well, and, and uh, the feedback I've gotten from patients is that patients I've done a, a rotator cuff repair on five years ago and used the pain pump said, boy, I like that block a lot better. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but I would say overall, it's been working very, very well, and our, our, our anesthesia colleagues have really done a very nice job in sort of uh, giving our patients the, the uh, sort of cutting edge in terms of anesthesia in town. It has been to some extent technology driven. The newer ultrasounds, the, the, the unit that gives you this picture is about $50,000, but it's worth it because it just, I mean, it gives you such a beautiful picture. This is the nerve we're trying to numb up. These are the individual nerve branches. And this black is the local anesthetic the anesthesiologist has just put around it. He can see that kind of detail when he's blocking you. And so it's just made it so much safer and so much more effective. And, and we did not have this technology five years ago. Not like this. I mean, it was kind of a snowstorm. 
Um, so it, we are the beneficiaries of all this wonderful biotech. Okay. Well, does it work? It works. Okay. Um, what are the results in your practice? So I've been very, very uh, pleased with the results of rotator cuff repairs in the properly selected patient. And by that, I mean patients that uh, need a surgery. I think there's uh, some patients that have rotator cuff tears that have very good function, no pain. You can most likely leave those alone. Um, we do know that if we leave the rotator cuff alone, it tends to tear more. So in our younger, more active patients, and by younger, sort of age is just a number. I really look at sort of activity level. Um, for those patients that have a small, medium, even large tear, I think they do very, very well. The patient that we struggle with is the patient that has a massive rotator cuff tear that may not be fixable. Uh, that is still the black box in shoulder surgery, in my opinion. There's no good augmentation that works. And by augmentation, I mean taking a piece of tissue and laying it over the top to be an interposition from rotator cuff, empty space, then to the bone. There's been many of those have been tried, but they don't quite cut the mustard. I don't know that I'd want one in my shoulder, my mom's shoulder, or my dad's shoulder at this point. That may happen, and that may be the, the best thing, but right now I would say for sure uh, active patients, rotator cuff uh, repair works very, very well. Um, our next topic is arthritis. And, you know, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and talk for a few minutes about that. I mean, at some point, you guys have had enough. Just let Sleeping us know. Bags. Yeah. Okay. So, same patient comes in the office and says, well, I can't even get my arm up over my head anymore. I can't reach my wallet. I have pain all the time. I have pain at night. What are your thoughts? Night pain, chronic pain, um, might be arthritis. We don't see as much shoulder arthritis as we see in the hips and the knees. You don't walk on your shoulders. We see an awful lot of rotator cuff. So this patient that comes in, I'd, I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, I'm gonna rely a little more on exam, okay? When we turn to the exam, some things jump out at you with arthritis. Uh, the most important thing is that it grinds, okay? It really is rough, and th th there's more of a motion loss, so the, the patient can't get it up, can't get it out as well. But when you do that simple rotation in and out, that, that you can feel that shoulder doing the catch and release. It's kind of a cogwheel. So the th I saw Mike's here, we've got some therapists in the audience, they know exactly what we're talking about. And the poor people that have had the replacements, I see some of them, they know what I'm talking about, it's rough. So the exam, I think, in the arthritis patient, it, it gives us the answer too. And in terms of you with, you know, kind of a fun part of this is to kind of play physician yourself, that inside out, rough grinding, that's arthritis. So does, does this patient need an MRI? You know, in, the typical answer is no, you don't. You, you, you can make the diagnosis by history and exam. We do get x-rays, and x-rays with arthritis are very confirmatory. And just to highlight that point, this is, they're obviously different shoulders, but this shoulder <coughs> shows uh, space between the ball and the socket. You can sort of see right through there. It looks like there's an empty space. This, there's no space. And that's what we call bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. That's arthritis. In, in my opinion, MRI is not going to help you arrive at that diagnosis. Right. So let's say you have, you, uh, have the same patient. You get this uh, x-ray. What are you going to do for him or her? We don't have a lot. <laughs> we don't have a lot here in terms of the little stuff. Okay, you can use your anti-inflammatories. You can do a little gentle physical therapy. Um, there, there may be a role for an occasional cortisone shot. You know, we've talked about cortisone, how it, uh, it's good and bad, and we know that 
it has a slight weakening effect, so we have to use it judiciously. Um, certainly I'll have patients in their late 80s and 90s with terrible shoulders. I'm not going to even consider surgery. You know, if they need an extra cortisone shot or two, they're getting it. Okay, come on in, you know. We'll have our date every six months or every year. Um, most of the time, with active people, with more severe disability, we are talking surgery. I'll make a quick point. I do have a lot of patients with fairly significant arthritis on one arm that do amazingly well. And part of that is that they can compensate with the other arm, okay? That other arm can be their reach arm, this can be their low arm. When patients um, break down and say, Doc, it's time, is often when they either can't sleep or when the other arm is starting to decompensate. And then they really are kind of falling apart, and then it's time to talk about, okay, we need to go to the next level. Okay. Okay. So as far as surgical treatments, um, a total shoulder replacement replaces both parts of the joint. A hemiarthroplasty replaces only one part. This is something called a hemicap, and I use this in my sort of younger patients with sort of the male pattern baldness of the uh, humeral head where the, the cartilage just wears out in the center. The socket looks okay, the rest of the humerus looks okay, but they are having a lot of pain and or they are sort of heavy laborers or won't give up the heavy lifting. This is a, a, a very good treatment option for that particular patient. Uh, in my practice, that's someone late 40s, early 50s, that's still really gonna be pounding on that shoulder. Um, so I think that's a, a good option. The thing you have to appreciate here, this is for a crater defect. This is for a very, what we call geographic defect, where you've got nice clear borders between defect and, and much of the remaining shoulder is okay. That, that isn't a very common scenario. Usually it's sort of a diffuse wear pattern where this isn't going to help. But in those situations, especially a trauma where they knock a hunk out and it can't be salvaged, this can be a wonderful kind of minimal, minimalist surgery to get them with a nice smooth, you know, head again. This is a animation of a shoulder replacement. So we start out with good cartilage and with age, the cartilage wears away and we're down to bare bone. It grinds, it's got bone spurs. We go in and we take off that spurred head. We open up the canal, we prepare it for a stem. We take the edge of the socket off and plane it, prepare it for this new plastic cup. And on the humeral side, we put our stem down inside, the bone grows into it and then we fit a perfectly sized ball that the bone, again, can grow into on top. This is growing into the stem, and then we close the shoulder back up. And that, that's, in essence, a shoulder replacement. That focal geographic defect, honest to God, very rare. Maybe one out of 100 patients you'll see. Almost all of us are gonna have a more generalized wear, more like that x-ray you saw where the whole thing is, is wearing out and to replace just part of it would be a terrible mistake. And so that's what we do. We do a replacement where we're giving a new ball and ideally a new socket. If you just take out the spurs and do the releases and just replace the ball, it's a very good outcome and that is still recommended in some circles for your younger, very active patient. But for most of us that are gonna be in our late 50s, 60s, 70s, we're ideally gonna try and do a socket and a ball because then the pain relief is just a little bit better because it truly is smooth on smooth. What's the average recovery time for your 62-year-old tennis player? You know, I had a, a golfer in today that is three months out from his shoulder replacement. He's a, he was a frightening patient because he has about a 10 index and when he needed his shoulder done and he had a really bad shoulder and he was in today at three months out, and he's already out golfing the big courses. I wasn't quite happy, to be quite honest. I was, he goes, we golfing tomorrow? I go, no, we're not golfing tomorrow. Um, but he goes, why not? I golfed yesterday, I golfed last weekend. Um, that's not what we want to see, but it happens. You know, it's certainly within the realm. In general, 
Whenever you've got bone growing in, it's like a fracture. Those are spot welds, and we really want to protect that from these torsional loads for three months. So my avid golfers, um, with their hips, with their shoulders, three months non-negotiable. It's a focused, low-impact, non-torsional rehab program. I don't, is that kind of what you I, use? I agree completely. Yeah. And, and then we start the functional. My friend's just going a little fast on the functional stuff. Okay. Um, this is just an x-ray. It's a, a little off-center showing what the, the animation showed. So this is the stem that the bone will grow into. That's the, the sized cup on top, the ball that will replace the patient's ball. We maintain all the, the rotator cuff. We, we, that's all intact. We have to open up the front. We close it back down. And that little tiny piece of metal there, that white thing is a piece of metal, that's actually in the stem of the socket. And, and that's there so that we can, with future x-rays, make sure that nothing is moving. So they put that metal in to make my job and Otto's job easier to make sure nothing is changing with time that might be of concern. And the good news with shoulders is they last really well. Again, you're not walking on them the way you walk on a knee or a hip. And so the excellent longevity you hear about hips and knees, it's even more so on the shoulder side. So that's pretty exciting for us. And this is a video of another friend. He had two terrible shoulders. He's had both shoulders replaced. And that's just, you know, he had a 240-yard drive there. Um, he, he, he's in hog heaven. He lives on the course. He's an ambassador. He plays multiple times a week. It, it it's, it's, was thrilling for him. <laughs>